I had chronic brain fog. I never felt rested when I woke up. I got migraines all the time. I was hungry all the time, and people feared for their lives when they were around me when I got hungry because I crashed and turned into a crazy person. And just felt generally cranky and bad, basically. The outlook on life prior to being diagnosed and figuring out what was going on was pretty bleak. I had chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. Chronic migraines, that was a huge one. I had chronic gastrointestinal issues, and I saw gastroenterologists for several years, and no one ever told me it could be related to food. I thought that I had early onset rheumatoid arthritis. I had chronic adult acne. I had numbness in my feet and in my limbs. I was always cold. Everything and anything I took really didn't provide me any relief whatsoever. How old would I have been, like 35 or 34 or something? You're not probably not supposed to feel that crappy at that age, right? That's not old, um, but I felt old. I had come to just really live with it. It became part of my life. I remember feeling strange feeling weird from very early on, you know, not feeling healthy, not feeling like I, I live to full capacity, even as a child, you know, and that's weird. I mean, the thing is, is everyone is so sick in this country. Our food system is so broken. And the solution given to me by my GP was, don't worry, if you take these meds now, you'll be able to keep these, you know, suppress uh, these issues that you're, that you're currently facing, and you should be able to live longer. It's amazing, you know, it's like the human body just gets comfy with stuff or accepting of, of conditions and just kind of like, you know, it's like, oh, this is gonna hurt or I have a bum knee or I have a whatever, okay, we'll just kind of deal with it, we'll compensate, we'll be fine. And so you get used to those things. And so same thing happened with me. I just felt horrible, but did it for so long that I forgot how bad I actually felt and how it felt to feel good. I was never extremely sick, but I was never well either. I was vegetarian for about six years. I ate fish sometimes, but was mostly vegetarian and also mostly dairy-free because the person I was with at the time had a dairy allergy. So in addition to being vegetarian, I was also eating way more soy than anyone should ever consume over their lifetime because we had all the dairy substitutes, like the fake butter and the soy milk and the... I don't even remember what else, but it was all pretty horrible. And I also worked in vegetarian restaurants at the time, and that was my life, basically, and was eating seitan, which is wheat gluten sandwiches on rye bread. So I was just eating a like straight up gluten sandwich. So gluten and soy were like my main staples in my diet, and I was completely the angry chef that threw pants. I was psychotic <laughs> and not a happy person. And of course there were other factors. It wasn't 
100% diet, but that played a huge role. I was definitely the sickest I've ever been and the unhappiest I've ever been. <laughs> My husband was paleo for almost a year. And through that year, every time I ate, I had just horrid pain, stomach pain. And he would say, I really think that you have celiac and I think you need to get it checked out. And if you have it, if you take about a pinch of saffron, you'll want to- uh, My specialty as a chef was Italian. After about a year, we were having a celebration. It was one of the kids' birthdays, and I was making, of course, all of that. And there he was, making his own dinner. And I looked at him and I said, you're like really never gonna have my pizza and pasta again, are you? And he goes, no. And he said, I really think that you have celiac and you really need to go get it checked out. They checked for the wrong antibodies. I checked out negative. The doctor that was sitting there talking to me said, you're negative, but you know what we're gonna do? He said, I really think from what you're telling me, I really think that you might have celiac. And so we're gonna do a biopsy of your colon. And he starts telling me how he's going to cut into my colon. And as he's telling me, he's nodding off, falling asleep. And I'm just like, mm -hmm, that doesn't sound like a good option to me. And I thought, why is the next step so invasive? Why isn't it just cut these foods from your diet? Why not start there? I got diagnosed with celiac disease about four years ago and was lucky enough where I had typical GI issues and very physical manifestations of that. So if I ate gluten, I knew that I ate it and felt horrible. So went gluten-free and that did not fix things. So we tried gluten-free, we tried gluten-free vegan, we tried all of those different variations of it. I ended up with no energy and puffy. It's the only way I can kind of describe that. So it's like my body fat percentage took a nosedive in the wrong direction. Um, and I was lethargic and just didn't, it just didn't feel good that way. So we did that for maybe six months or so. And then said, that's enough of that um, and went back. I grew up in Olympia, Washington. I grew up in a totally normal family, your standard American family, and grew up eating cereal and bagels and Subway sandwiches. And there was no, there was no food in the food that I was eating. There was, there was no, you know, pasture roaming animals. There was no grass fed meat. There were no seasonal local vegetables. It was like whatever we could pick up and throw in a plastic bag at the grocery store and like whatever's on sale. general health consciousness was very strongly present in my life because my parents run a pharmacy. My father was a pharmacist, which means that we ate healthy according to conventional wisdom on what is a healthy diet. So I ate very little meat, no fat at all that was forbidden. We had the fat substitutes, of course, every day on the table, margarine instead of butter, <clears throat> the heart healthy uh, alternative. None of us in the family was healthy. My father suffered psoriasis heavily. My mother had severe asthma. My uh, sister, which I discovered now, clearly had a histamine problem. I had this uh, number of, of health issues. You know, I had this asthma as well, skin problems, major energy dips throughout the day. As being a child, you know, I, now I realize what was the reason for that. I was never able to wake up in the morning. Uh, I was held to drag my body to school and uh, to pay attention in school. I couldn't, I was in, it was impossible. I would fall asleep in the, in the first hours of class. Nobody could tell me why that was. And nobody questioned it even, you know. So 
from this background, you know, it would have been different if we would have grown up in a family eating junk food all the time. We did not. So we, we were obviously doing everything correct according to, to conventional standards. I had several inflammations going on in my body. I had aching joints all the time. I was lethargic, tired all day long. It doesn't even matter if I had slept six hours or 12 or 14 hours. I was just tired the entire day. My life before going paleo was pretty much that of a fitness nut, like just doing silly workouts at a commercial gym. I think uh, people are really tired of um, the conventional stuff they've been told for years so they they eventually are really ready for a change I went to my doctor in my early 30s and my doctor said to me based on your blood work and based on the results that we've got back you have an increased risk of X, Y, and Z in terms of lifestyle diseases. My blood sugar was very high, my cholesterol levels were high, um, my blood pressure was very high. When I asked him for lifestyle alternatives, he said, well, you're eating a low fat diet and you're currently going to the gym. So there's nothing else you can do. You're kind of doing the right things. You're not a drinker, you don't smoke, everything's fine. Uh, it's, just, it's just about your genetic heritage and the fact you're getting a little bit older. I didn't accept that, really because I was scared of taking those medications, especially in the long term. I've been practicing as a doctor for about 25 years. Most of my patients come with what we would call chronic or sort of long-standing health issues. Some of the problems might be things like irritable bowel syndrome, diabetes, headaches, migraine, general fatigue. Usually uh, the individual has either not had a good experience uh, with conventional medicine or conventional approaches and or there really isn't very much that conventional approaches can offer that person. But this is what's happening to people. They're just being told, just accept it. Here you go. Here's your diagnosis. Just, I'm sorry, this is the pill, take it. No, I'm sorry, you don't get any other choices. There's a reason why Conventional wisdom says do this, everybody does it, and it ends up all crappy. Well, I used to work in a hospital, and I became, once I learned about paleo and the benefits, I became so frustrated at, at the amount of drugs that were being pumped into people for stuff that could be solved with a good diet and some exercise. Wisdom is just such a, uh, it's such an oxymoron. When we use the word conventional wisdom, it seems like forever, but it's actually maybe five years old, or 10 years old, or 20 years old. It mortifies me sometimes to think of the numbers of people that are sick because they've been lied to. When people take conventional nutritional advice, as we generally have been for the last 30 or 40 years, to eat less fat and more carbohydrate rich foods, including starchy carbohydrates, this isn't good for health. It damages health. People underestimate how powerful taking charge of their diet can be. You know, we are just taught to walk into a grocery store and if it's in a box, it's in there, it's good for us. We can consume it, it's safe for human consumption, right? But the fact of the matter is, when you approach food without any of that awareness, you're not tapped in at all to the, what your body needs, what it needs to function and thrive. What you put into your body, that's your fuel. If you're not fueling your body right, it'll break down at some point, you know? This grain, you know, diet pyramid thing is pushed on people from like grade school. It's like that's all people know. You have to be able to recognize when the government and the corporations and the institutions and the society are lying to you or deceiving you or just simply don't know what they're talking about. They're ignorant and find out what's driving them. Where's the money, so to speak? We used to be instinctual creatures who would hunt and gather our own food, whether it be berries or vegetables or free range animals, you know, deer or bison.
Morning, mate. Hey. I've always had a really bad relationship with food, so I knew something had to change. I wanted to make sure that it was a sustainable change. Back to work. Yeah, I feel rested though, way better than I was when I left. I'd always struggle with sleeping and training, really. I mean, I'd always trained since a very early age. I've always played pretty competitive sports, but there's always been kind of something missing. I always knew that I wasn't getting the most out of what I could be, essentially. We had a patient come in one day. He was in his early 70s. He came in for a relatively minor operation. He'd never been in hospital before. That was the thing that, that really sort of stuck out at me. He also had never really been unwell. And I was amazed at how energised and vital this person was. And, you know, he's sort of 50 years older than me and in a much better state of health. I asked him to what he attributed, his good health and his wellness and his energy. And he explained to me that he thought a lot of it was down to some very simple things that he did in his life. The way he, he ate, he was a, a regular cyclist, for example. He was also just fundamentally very interested in life. My curiosity got the better of me again later that day when I went into town and ended up buying a book on nutrition. I decided to apply the principles in my own life. Uh, once I'd done that, uh, the effects on my own health and wellness were really nothing short of transformational. I like to eat food that is, resembles what it is in its true natural form. I like to be close to nature, I like to be outdoors a lot, I like to sleep according to my natural cycle, wake up feeling when my body feels like waking up. I like moving in the very functional sort of primal way, so that's hiking and running and rock climbing, just being out there and, and using my body and actually really feel like I'm living instead of sort of existing in an office cubicle, if that makes sense. So to me, paleo represents that very natural lifestyle, being in the sun and getting lots of vitamin D, eating sustainable food, cooking from scratch, it's a slow kind of living, which is also not slow in its sort of speed, it's just coming back to the way we used to live and used to feel, I suppose, as well. When I realized that the paleo lifestyle was scientifically sound, I would say it's been over the last three years. I mean, I came from a traditional medical background. I don't recall ever taking a single nutrition course. So most of my knowledge of how uh, our diets impacted health was similar to where everybody else was getting their information. But over the last few years, I've been doing a fellowship in anti-aging and regenerative medicine. And their focus is on diet to a certain extent. And so that's when I started to realize that there was a lot of scientific evidence that had been out there for years that was being ignored because it wasn't consistent with the conventional wisdom. And so it was just pushed aside, but I saw studies that were done 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that supported the improvements in health from a paleo type lifestyle. So that's when I started to realize that there was legitimacy on a scientific basis. Paleo is eating whole foods, real foods, that you either get from a farm or you get from, you know, your rancher. I mean, you can get them from the store, obviously, but you don't get them from a box. It also sometimes has shrimp paste as an optional ingredient. It's about eating real food 
eating food that our grandparents would recognize as food, eating food that isn't from a factory, but is from farms and ranches in our backyards optimally if we can garden without killing everything, which I can't. People are skeptical about paleo and like, oh my God, what do you eat out so hard? And you can serve them something like this that has so much flavor. There's a, a very different um, consciousness about the sourcing of your food, where it comes from, how it's prepared, the oils that it's prepared in, and just kind of your relationship to being able to prepare those things yourself in your own kitchen. The focus is all about eating high quality foods, eating natural foods, and eating foods that are actually good for you and will, will help fuel you as opposed to just being for weight loss. What would common sense dictate would be the best diet for us as a species? Well, you could argue a diet based on the foods that we've been eating the longest in terms of our time on this planet. I mean, those are the foods we've evolved to eat that we're likely to be best adapted to and are going to be broadly the best for us. So how long have we been evolving? Well, it depends who you ask. But if you ask an evolutionist, there's a pretty stock answer. It's about two and a half million years. Paleo from a dietary perspective is really a way of modelling what our ancient ancestors did in terms of hunter-gatherers and taking the best of that and applying it to, to what we should do today in terms of food. In terms of our food choices, it's wild meat, wild fish, vegetation, fruit, nuts, and really trying to look at the kind of macronutrient ratios that our hunter-gatherer ancestors uh, had as part and parcel of their eating habits. The diet really has to be in place for everything else to work as well. When we treat patients, really, I would say over 80% of what we do it has to do with the diet. At this point, it's an intervention, you oh, know, absolutely. and we're trying to get you as yeah, healthy as well, we can get you. We can. We yeah. can see, you know, the results already. Right, you know, right. So. And so our goal is always to have you um, get most of your nutrition from your food. My doctor was quite surprised to see the difference. Yeah. A plus is what he said. Really? Mm -hmm. And you got to change some of your medications, right? Yes, he has. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what did he take off? Well, we got rid of uh, the okay. atenethol. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So since November, then your weight's dropped about 22, 24 yeah. pounds? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And that's just, is that still continuing or yes. are you oh, yeah. plateauing or? No, no. no still. It's okay. a nice surprise when you Isn't get on the nice? scale and go, oh, yeah. oh where does right. that go? It's With the, the diet that you're on yeah. and, you know, as you lose weight, your need for that, your, you know, insulin sensitivity will hopefully improve and you'll need less and less of that medication, so. Right. And as you, you drop your blood pressure or your weight, your blood pressure medication can come down too. Yep. But it's, we, it's like a one, one happens in the next, then what happens in the next. You're not depriving yourself of anything. The only thing you're depriving you yourself it. of is chips right. and bread. You know, and, and all the things that aren't good for you. Which you don't miss. My um, a coworker uh, said to me, they were having a pizza party for um, someone who was retiring. And, and so I had my stuff. And they said, well, she turned to me, and she's had a heart attack. And she uh, has been told not to eat, you know, the fast food and the stuff that she always eats. When are you going to eat? get back to eating real food? And I said, well, <laughs> I, but I am. <laughs> but I am. When right. are you going to get to eat real food again? And she's just slopping down her tacos from Taco Bell every day. A lot of times, once the diet is in place, a lot, the others follow. The sleep improves, uh, the weight goes away. We were satisfied with, with what we knew to be, and we thought this was it. And you grow old and you die, and, and you feel mis miserable, and you have aches and pains, and that's just part of the life process. And we know that that doesn't have to be. So we're moving more, we're feeling better. It's incredible. I remember growing up and my grandmother would go to the markets every morning and she would buy meat from the butcher. She would bring back uh, bags of vegetables and fruit. We would go hunting, um, fishing, quite often, you know, foraging for berries and mushrooms. And she would cook from scratch. That's not that far back. When people say, well, actually, it's not possible to try and live, um, you know, ancestral way in the modern world. I say, well, we're not, we're not actually 
literally doing that. We're just saying, hey, how about we take away some of these, you know, industrial processes and mutating our food and, and changing things the way they should be naturally and just try to leave a little bit more the way that we intended to by nature. So when do we first start to cultivate crops of things like corn and wheat? Well, the paleontological record suggests that this was probably just about 10,000 years ago. Now, that sounds like a long time ago, uh, but from an evolutionary perspective, it's very recent, and genes change very slowly. While, you know, foods like grains and refined sugar and refined vegetable oils are relatively recent additions to the diet, the average diet has about 70% of calories contributed by these foods. A lot of people do have to eat every two hours to sustain their blood sugar because they're eating foods that are causing them to crash. And I used to be one of those people and I used to have to bring food with me all the time because if I went two hours without eating, I would crash and feel really awful. When people think that they need to eat every two hours to sustain their blood sugar, it's because they're eating foods that are not sustaining their blood sugar. If all you're craving is bread and cookies and pancakes and cupcakes and all that, then yes, it is restrictive because you shouldn't be eating those things. If you eat a lot of, for example, either sugary or starchy foods, you're going to tend to get quite high levels of sugar in the bloodstream. If blood sugar levels go very high, the problem is, is that a huge surge of insulin can drive blood sugar levels to sort of subnormal levels. When blood sugar levels get low, People can get tired and a bit listless. In fact, that was a major cause of my problems with fatigue when I was a lot younger. But also it can tend to make people hungry and to crave foods, specifically for say sweet foods, be it you know chocolate or candy or biscuits or cookies and, and foods like those. That's a really good way of, of describing a slave to food because so many of us are dependent on these addictions. We you know we have this, we actually are addicted to sugar and carbohydrates. People say, oh no, I just like bread and I like pasta. And I say, no, no, you're addicted to bread and pasta. <laughs> My biggest challenge becoming paleo was giving up carbs and sugar. Um, that was awful. <laughs> it is hard. And because they're craving their sugar fix, once you get past that withdrawal stage, it becomes much easier. Once you start eating satiating foods that are nutritious, you don't, you, well, A, you start craving nutritious foods. That's another little thing that's changed. You don't feel like you need to eat right away to, to kind of, to feel human again. You know, I call it hangry. People would just get hungry and angry and you don't want to be near them at that time until they get their little muesli bar. A lot of people that have the experience of craving sweet foods and then succumbing to eating them Imagine that they lack self-control or they have a weak will or an inadequate personality, but actually the reality is for the majority of these people, the problem isn't some sort of psychological frailty, it's a physiological imbalance. And very often that imbalance has been induced by eating a supposedly healthy, low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. The majority of people with celiac disease don't have digestive uh, symptoms. So most people think of celiac disease and they think, oh, you got GI issues and you have all the stomach aches and you have all this kind of stuff. And that's not the case at all. Most people don't have those symptoms. Most people are just munching away on their Wonder Bread and stuff. And they, you know, they have no idea that by eating that, that's tied to their migraines or their, you know, whatever other condition that they have, you know, whether it's gluten intolerance or celiac disease, it can manifest in any part of your body, not just the digestive tract. And most people think, oh, if I don't have a stomach ache, then I'm fine. And that's not the case at all. It's actually almost on the verge of scary how much it can make me not be pleasant. I mean, like a complete asshole. I mean, like just a complete jerk. And I know that I'm being a jerk. So it's like, I'm like, God, why are you being such a, and I can't, I just, it's like, I can't do anything to change it. So 
Yeah, gluten's nasty. There seems to be an increasingly recognized correlation between gluten issues and brain issues. And whether that's the form of uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, whether that's attention deficit disorders in children, whether that's even autism. You know, conventional wisdom is grains are good and you got to eat however many servings they say you have to eat of grains now and stuff like that. People need to question where that came from, how that came about, why that started, why we're doing all that, not just accepting it at face value. There's ample evidence that grains uh, are detrimental to health because of their anti-nutrient qualities. So basically they contain compounds that are harmful and detrimental to the, to the gut. So they affect digestion, they irritate the lining of the gut, they prevent certain nutrients from being absorbed. By doing so, you're not getting the best out of the other foods that you're eating. When our colon is damaged, and so protected by one cell with the protection, so it's easy to, dam like this, I just damaged my colon, that's all it would take, something like that, that kind of an irritation, that, like that. Mum had like a wheat and, and gluten intolerance yeah. and we've both kind of picked that up as well. So I think one of the biggest things for me especially is the fact that I'm not bloated anymore. Like I'm not, I don't feel that real lethargy after I've eaten a big meal. And I'm now eating, feeling sustainably full and then feeling good an hour to two hours later rather than wanting to sort of fall asleep on the sofa or something. Yeah, yeah that was, yeah, that yeah, was yeah, a big, definitely. big difference, definitely. Mark, can you bring me down some packs, mate? Yeah. Can I have some uh, mango? I used to work shifts in a hospital, so coming from a shift to the gym to work out, there was nothing available. I couldn't just stop in a supermarket. And that really frustrated me. And, and there was nothing. You could either buy a chicken breast that was pumped full of potato starch or rice starch or something, or you could have some fruit. And there was nothing complete, nothing that, that would help us. So we decided to, to do it ourselves. If we'd have known what we know now, like 10 or 15 years ago, we would have changed like someone's life that's really close to us. So like our, our mum died from cancer. So if we'd have known all this stuff 15, 20 years ago, potentially we could have changed it, you know? Yeah, we maybe couldn't have, you know, changed the fact that she died, but we could have probably yeah. made, made a big impact. Yeah, definitely. So it's. And this is why, like, it's so close to us and, and the gym and the whole ethos is a lifestyle shift. And we just want to try and help, like, shift that because we know that there's better stuff out there, you know? For an increasing proportion of the population, the grains are very inflammatory in the bowel, and that sets up a lot of inflammation elsewhere in the body. And since inflammation is the main driver for disease, then we want to keep the inflammation low. Back when I was still eating a standard American diet, and I was a traditionally practicing physician, I had a daughter who struggled with a lot of health issues, primarily gastrointestinal type issues. So we went the gamut of the traditional medicine model. You know, she saw gastroenterologists and had studies done and was were given medications, none of which made any difference in her situation. And then she on her own tried 
different kinds of diets because she knew intuitively that there had to be a dietary component to what was going on, even though I couldn't really guide her at that point. But she tried vegetarianism and veganism. None of those were healthy for her either. She ended up in the hospital several times, actually. At the time, my mom was a very conventional physician of Western medicine, and she did not agree at all with what I was doing. I mean, at, at that point, her belief system was that supplements and medication could really help cure chronic conditions. It was a relief to me to see her improving finally. I did feel badly. I didn't have the knowledge base years earlier that I could have helped her. You know, I grew up living off of these foods that were in the middle of the alleys of these grocery stores when nothing I was eating was ever alive. And that's what we're taught, and it's just so broken to me. As a kid, when I ate stuff like this, I, I drained half the box, you know, so... Uh, a big bowl. A big bowl. So there's 18, uh, 18 servings, let's just round it up and say 20. Um, so let's say when, you know, the kid goes to town on this, we've got 10 servings, it's like 270 grams of carbs in the sitting, which is a piece of cake to do. I oh, mean, absolutely no that's problem to huge. do that. Yeah, same serving size, even a little little more carbohydrate dense. And you know, honestly, this, this stuff would be so sweet that I, I might even eat less than that in a, in a way, even as a kid. So then you've got the kashi, it's whole grain, and you know, it looks like yeah, heart right. seals are being saved on this thing and all that stuff. And uh, so th their serving is a little bit larger. It's a full cup, but it's 41 grams of carbs. So really, I think this one is even more carb dense than, than the other. The, the uh, frosted, frosted flakes are. So yeah, it, you know, this stuff is so damn yummy and it's really just not very good for you. Uh, just given the carbohydrate content, and again, nobody is gonna sit down and eat a cup of this. Well, you know, I think that it's probably easy in the morning for kids to get up and eat cereal and, and, and have some milk, but what we're seeing is an epidemic of uh, obesity and insulin resistance with children today. Right. Right. And um, which is which is in diabetes, which is a huge problem. And um, these boxes and bags of food that are prepared with high carbohydrates and high sugar are definitely causing that. Right. And the, the soda at lunch and the Gatorade yeah. at the soccer game before dinner, yeah. And pretty yeah. soon they have a carbohydrate load that is far exceeds anything that any human should ever consume. Right. So sugar comes obviously from sugar in the diet, but it also comes from starch. Starch is sugar. It's just chains of glucose molecules. When we eat starchy foods like bread, potatoes, rice, pasta and breakfast cereals, generally we get considerable amounts of sugar liberated into the bloodstream that will obviously lead to considerable surges in the hormone insulin. The purpose of insulin at that stage is to force the blood glucose into muscle tissue, into the cells, to be utilized as energy. Any excess is stored in the liver. Long-term storage is glycogen. And then beyond that, it's stored as fat. Elevated insulin basically means we have a constant supply of energy and so there is no need for your body to break down further energy stores, i.e. fat stores, to provide energy. So what insulin does is facilitate the uptake of fat into the fat cells. The fat can get out again, but unfortunately insulin reduces the body's ability to do that. It impairs what we call lipolysis, which is fancy language for release of fat, basically. Eating little and often, which is well, from what conventional wisdom tells us, to manage blood glucose is far less effective than eating um, a larger meal. We're always digesting and never building. It's the wrong system. We need to eat, absorb what we're eating, digest it, build an anabolic environment, go hours without eating, then eat again. So we're not, we're not grazers. We're not ruminants. There's just something wrong with that whole concept. Evolutionary, dietary, health-wise. If you're eating a diet based on foods that help basically bring 
insulin levels down, stabilize blood sugar levels, then you're going to facilitate fat loss. You can effectively then use that fat as a fuel, a bit like a hibernating bear. Once I cut out the grains and the really high carby stuff, I was able to go hours and hours without eating. And I might feel hungry, I might feel like I need to eat, I'm getting to the point where I'm hungry, but it wasn't an emergency. I could go without eating, which I found really strange, and not feel really hungry and then eat dinner and then be fine and continue eating the, the next day as normal. Essentially feeding off your own fat, coupled with the fact that you've probably stabilized blood sugar levels and are gonna be less prone to low blood sugar levels that can trigger hunger, is going to leave people fundamentally less hungry. If you take individuals off their supposedly healthy high carb diet and put them on something a bit lower carb, a bit more paleo, then they automatically eat less. And I've seen this time and again in practice. Typically people will eat several hundred calories less each day eating this way. So now you have a diet that facilitates fat loss, that is fundamentally healthy, that does not leave people hungry. I went through a very significant stage of a classic bodybuilder's diet in the sense of many small meals a day with a decline in carbohydrates throughout the day, absolutely no fat and so on. This led to several crash diets even because I wasn't able to shed fat. I actually invented a diet of my own at a certain point which was a bar of chocolate and many liters of water a day. <laughs> uh, just to say like how far it went. It, it led to a very unnatural and disturbed take on diet and relation with food. From the age of 16 until the age about of 25, that's almost 10 years, I was obsessed with eating low fat food. It was drilled into me through magazine articles and, and TV ads and everything had to be low fat. Um, who knows how much damage I've done by like, cutting out all the actual goodness of saturated fats in the foods. That just kind of stuck with me. That was the hardest thing to shift when I started eating paleo is to, to shift my thinking from saturated fat is bad to actually saturated fat is not the enemy. It's the, the high processed sugars and carbohydrates that's causing a lot of the problems. The reality is if you look at the evidence, there isn't really very much to be feared in fat. It doesn't appear to be inherently fattening. And that's possibly because of its impact or lack of impact on certain hormones, including insulin. It helps transport essential fatty acids and uh, uh, fat-soluble vitamins and nutrients to our body. Without that ability, we wouldn't be able to absorb all our fat-soluble vitamins and nutrients. A low-fat diet makes that very difficult. There are many ways to, to, uh, to lose weight, and, and some people can lose weight on a low-fat diet. I was able to manage my weight for a very long time based on a low-fat diet, but I wasn't healthy. So weight alone is not the, the, shouldn't be seen as the mark of good health. Those on very low-fat diets, you know, your skin will deteriorate, you, you, your hair will be in much you know, worse condition. In the world of very low-fat diets being the fashion or the norm or conventional wisdom telling us that's the norm, we tend to kind of avoid dietary fat, but it's extremely important. For myself as being male, and suffering from low testosterone for much of my adult life, part of that reason was because I wasn't eating any, any, any fat to, to, <laughs> that I could be aware of. I was minimizing fat at, at every single opportunity, and it wasn't until I started adding uh, dietary fat to my diet that I started to have healthy levels of testosterone. If we did not eat fat, we would die. There are essential fatty acids, there are essential amino acids. If we do not eat protein, we will die. There are no essential carbohydrates. The fact that we're suffering from a lot of diseases in terms of mental degeneration, a lot of this again is linked to uh, excess carbohydrates and not enough, and, and it's following a low-fat diet. Most of our brain is fat. Our cell membranes are part of fat. It provides structural and integrity to every cell in the body. It's not just an energy source, but as an energy source, it is far superior to glucose and carbohydrates in, any, in every measure. It's the preferred fuel for our heart. A lot of hormones are reliant on, on uh, access to dietary fat and, and cholesterol, dietary cholesterol. My family is one of those families with high cholesterol, and my grandma has been eating margarine since the 50s when one of her family members had a heart attack at a young age and is still horrified of an egg yolk. 
Some people find a correlation between dietary cholesterol and heart disease. That's wrong. The problem with uh, cholesterol and heart disease is oxidated cholesterol, which is inflamed cholesterol, not dietary or serum cholesterol. When you have an inflammation in the body, you can oxidize your cholesterol and that can cause problems. So the issue is not to eliminate or suppress cholesterol, which is fundamental to our health. In fact, it's the most powerful antioxidant in our body, and now we're suppressing it. What we should be doing is eliminating the cause of the inflammation. What's the cause of the inflammation? Bad dietary choices. Our rush towards a diet away from fat towards carbohydrate-rich foods could be actually fueling rates of, for example, overweight and obesity, but also allied problems, including cardiovascular disease, heart disease and stroke, and what we call type 2 diabetes. One of the prevailing theories as to what it is that actually causes illness, be it type 2 diabetes or excess weight or cardiovascular disease, relates to a physiological process known as inflammation. So for example, if I you know, kick a table hard enough with bare feet, after an hour or two I'm going to have a red, swollen, tender toe. That is inflammation. But we're talking about here a sort of lower grade inflammation throughout the body, what's called systemic inflammation. Basically, it's inflammation that occurs in the body that isn't easily detected at a kind of microscopic level. Uh, that's the kind of starting point for a lot of chronic lifestyle diseases. Now, systemic inflammation appears to be a potent cause of excess weight and other chronic diseases. One of the things that causes inflammation within the body is spikes in blood sugar. Now that is a, another reason for not eating a diet replete with foods that actually cause spikes in blood sugar. Some can be caused by exercise or stress or injury, but most of the negative inflammatory responses are from our modern diet, and those are foods that we should, were not designed to eat, and that's grains, legumes, processed foods, pasteurized dairy. Another thing that we know causes inflammation is a sort of fat called the omega-6 fats that we find, for example, in vegetable oils. So you find it in sunflower oil or safflower oil or soy oil. So very often we're advised to eat these in preference to saturated fat, but actually there's an argument for saying that the inflammation caused by omega-6 fats, as I say, in vegetable oils, is something that we should probably avoid. As our gut becomes more permeable, larger and larger molecules can move into, through our gut into the bloodstream. The body doesn't recognize these as, as me, it recognizes them as not me. So it develops an antibody to attack it. Now these things, these little structures, tend to resemble other parts of our body that are me. So as the antibodies go in and attack that thing, then they go, they're moving down the bloodstream and they go, oh, that knee joint looks a lot like that thing I just attacked, and it attacks the knee or it attacks something else. As the inf inflammation gets worse, the assault on the colon continues through this excess of grain and legume and processed food. The, the junctions widen and widen and widen and the problem gets more and more exacerbated and more and more serious. There's significant evidence that this type of inflammation leads to a whole host of modern lifestyle diseases from heart disease, strokes, diabetes, cancer, the whole gamut of, of modern lifestyle disease. Whatever is weakest in your body, the inflammation will attack and have the most damage to. And we see the, the symptoms manifest perhaps uniquely in different individuals, but they share a common cause, poor food choices in their diet. Repeated exposure to certain foodstuffs, repeated exposure to toxins, the inability for the body to defend itself in the long term is what allows disease to manifest itself. And that takes a significant period of time. So this isn't about a short-term exposure to, say, gluten. It's what happens over repeated exposure from years to decades to a generation or so of exposure to these foods that becomes harmful and affects us in terms of long-term chronic lifestyle disease. New squeeze on chiffon liquid margarine. The squeeze is on. Now there are some fats in the diet that really should be avoided. For example, the industrially produced fats, so processed fats, 
one example of that are what we call partially hydrogenated fats that are used in the processing of many processed food, including some margarines. There are other forms of processing. There's something called interesterification, which involves basically chopping up fats with enzymes and then reassembling them into completely novel fats. Trans fats are extremely unhealthy. They have been linked to, to, to heart disease. They're a, a, a man-made product uh, by and large. When we eat fat that's been overheated or chemically altered, they're now in a structure that our body doesn't recognize and it doesn't know what to do with them. It has to be stored somehow as a toxin, maybe surrounded in body fat, or it causes an inflammation. It's not a healthy source of fat and our body recognizes it and has to try to deal with it. That's why, I mean, you can see even conventionally a lot of manufacturers are now trying to reduce the amount of trans fats or eliminate trans fats entirely because the evidence is overwhelming that they're an unhealthy source of, of fat. On the other hand, I think there's nothing to be feared in fats found naturally in the diet, particularly in whole foods where you find those fats naturally within that food, for example, a piece of meat. When I talk to people about what I eat, they get surprised that, I'm, that I look the way that I look and I'm not, you know, huge, as big as a couch because I do eat a lot of saturated fat, you know, lots of eggs and lots of butter, um, uh, meat, you know, I, I, I eat fatty cuts of meat, I love my pork belly and things like that. I never used to cook with certain parts of meat, you know, it was always chicken breast, steak, maybe some minced meat, sausages, kind of your typical protein sources. Whereas now, you know, I'm trying out offal, I'm trying out different cuts of meat, more nose to tail kind of dining and cooking, which I think A is more ethical and, and you know, healthier for the planet because we're utilizing all of the animal but it's also very nutritious you know making bone broth and and cooking with all parts of the meat that you get there's two cows worth of bones in there wow. um, so we started with this yeah. these are the sort of trimming so all the crystals all the bones go straight into a tub we boil them up for two days a lot of american customers come in as well they're asking for it specifically uh, i mean we we sort of market this we don't call it bone broth particularly um, we have a market as a, a moose shot which is just a, a quarter pound little tub because yeah, neck bef just... before or after you've been training, so it's like a beef tea. It's so popular. Oh yeah, the amount of animals that we sort of kill in the course of a week. Yeah. I wouldn't sleep on a night unless we utilise every last little bit of it. Um, you know, if I'm taking that in with life, you've got to have some respect for the creature and use every last little bit of it. Okay, so I'll have them here at picnic if you need us. Okay, bye. So since everything that we do is local and seasonal, we change our menu all the time. So basically the way that we inform customers of what we have is we update this lunch board here and then we hang little signs in the fridge so people know which entree they're getting. I feel like we work around the clock, you know, cause we're always kind of trying to keep things updated in such a small space. We're always having to like re-merch things and move stuff around. And I mean, if you guys could see like how funny it is for us to like run out of soup and clean the soup well with our little tiny sinks it's you know it's kind of a logistical nightmare so we just have tried to figure out so many ways to to work around it i mean anytime someone approaches me and they're like i want to i want to build one of these or i want to you know build a business around paleo it's like you have to know like especially trailer living it's a hundred hour a week job minimum minimum i mean constantly from the day, the second I get up in the morning, baking to then running the shop to then going home and checking in social media and responding to emails. You do need the proper fuel though to keep that, that energy going. Otherwise, you would never be able to thrive. I mean, I think that the only reason why I'm able to work, the amount I'm able to work is because of the nutrition that I focus on. So here's the thing about saturated fat. I am by no means a scientist. I am just someone who loves butter. I love the way that it tastes. I love the way it makes me feel. And the fact that I eat it every day and it makes me feel better, it makes my brain feel clearer, and it's made my weight stabilize 25 pounds lighter than it used to be, makes me feel like it's a pretty awesome food. I'm gonna be honest with you. <laughs> Suddenly I could eat uh, saturated fat and I did because I hadn't for so many time for such a long time. So uh, I loved it yeah? and I went all the way for it. People were worried about that and they thought, okay, this can't be healthy. Of course, I 
I've, I've delivered proof that it did, uh, that it was healthy, in fact, or did not uh, completely destroy my health as was predicted. We have this notion that certain fats cause heart disease, like the ones that we find in red meat and dairy products, so-called saturated fat. That doesn't stand up either. There really is no evidence linking saturated fat with heart disease. All of the things that we're concerned about in terms of anti-aging, so most women are preoccupied with this, you know, we want to care about our skin and our hair and, and so on. Saturated fats ex is extremely important for this aspect of, of kind of cell development. If you look at all the major reviews in the last few years, and there's been three or four of them, none of them actually link saturated fat with heart disease. I can't believe it's not butter. Fresh butter tastes with 70% less saturated When you think fat about it, this whole idea that saturated fat does not cause heart disease may sound vaguely heretical, OK? Because we've had that drummed into us for the last 30 or 40 years. But saturated fat is a constituent in many foods, including red meat. Now, you could argue that red meat has been in the human diet for about two and a half million years which would lead you to conclude that saturated fat has been in the human diet for about two and a half million years. When you look at the foods that are healthy for us to eat and they all have saturated fats in them, then what does that tell us? The egg white comes with an egg yolk. The fish protein comes with a fish fat. The animal protein comes with animal fat. We don't eat egg whites. We don't eat lean meat. We don't just re remove the fish oil from the fish and then eat the fish. We eat the entire animal. That's how it's found in nature. That's how we're supposed to eat it. That's the best thing for our body. So when you look at it through that lens, it perhaps doesn't look so mad that saturated fat doesn't appear to cause heart disease at all. People are encountering you know, higher rates of heart disease than ever before, even though we've had 30 years of this low-fat diet mantra. It definitely isn't, isn't working. Um very excited anytime I see an article in the media about how maybe saturated fat isn't that bad for us and I feel like we're coming out of the dark ages on at least that level. By increasing the amount of dietary fat that I've, I've been taking I've actually improved my blood profile, my blood marker profile for cholesterol and triglycerides. That's evidence for me that this journey is worthwhile partaking. Our overall activity level shrinks down dramatically. So we sit in an office for eight to 12 hours. Then we drive directly into a bar, sitting down again, sitting in the car, sitting in a bar, going home, sitting on the couch in front of a TV. So basically all we do is sitting and getting from our chair to our car or to the next chair. The whole ethos now is to sit down at a desk and at a computer all day. like. We sit in such a closed position, which is terrible for our posture, terrible for our bowel function, terrible for the whole way our body just processes food, energy, blood, water. It's a sad statement about the health of our population when people consider walking from one place to the other an exercise. That's just how we're supposed to move, right? There are tons of people coming into the box and having no results at all with or getting stuck throughout a, a routine uh, at a conventional gym or commercial gym. And then they, within the shortest time, like sometimes within two to four weeks, sometimes up to eight to 12 or 16 weeks, they get amazing results. Most of the time it goes hand in hand with an approach to the better diet. If you eat right, that's 85, 90%. If you go for walks, that's another 5%. But if you want to take it to the next step, then weight-bearing exercises, uh, anabolic exercises like weight training and sprint work would be best, or high-intensity uh, sprints on bikes, that type of thing. What we're doing here is 
we warm you up and then we get you through a really high intensity workout, which is like short but intense. So it's mimicking more this flight or fight mode and it's not extensive cardio and extensive stress levels. What you don't want to do is chronic repetitive long distance cardio, so events that would be more than 20 or 30 minutes. Sprints cause a powerful positive hormonal cascade in the body, increasing testosterone growth hormone release, which tends to create an anabolic environment that burns fat and builds muscle. So a sprint would be, I think, probably the most powerful single form of exercise you can do. I would put it even higher than weight training. I would put weight training just slightly below that because you're using your full body. Now, so for some people who have, uh, can't run sprints, the, the second best thing would be do sprints on an exercise bike and then combine that with weight training. And weight training is just putting a certain set of muscles through a sprint against a weight. If you think of counting the reps as just a way of counting time, then you just, and each rep is taking, say, three seconds, then you do 10 reps as a 30 second activity. So that's how you would look at weight training. Rather than activating a, a, a very small set of muscles or a, a small um, area of their body, we're just trying to make and help people get the most out of their body. Functional movement's not. It's not just about lifting heavy weights and sort of burpees, you know. There's a lot of movement in nature that we do already that's very functional and it's the way our body is designed to move. Whether it's swimming in the ocean or hiking the mountains or in my case, you know, I like rock climbing because it's something very primal. There's flow when you do it. It's almost like a meditative state. You know, you're using the whole body. You're kind of playing with, with another object and it's a very social sport, almost sort of tribal to me anyway, but I think people have to sort of re-evaluate re what functional movement is. Sometimes it's just walking up the hill really fast or climbing up a tree or lifting heavy boxes and, and things like that. You can find functional movement in everyday life. We need to have an adequate and substantial amount of movement in order to be better aligned with our genetic heritage. I'll probably keep it out here. Again, looking at our hunter-gatherer ancestors, they had to move as part and parcel of their day-to-day -day existence. If they didn't move, they couldn't eat. It was as simple as that. So today, although we don't have to hunt and gather our food as we did in the past, we still need to mimic some of those ancestral movement patterns. So from walking to sprinting to, to lifting heavy loads to kind of crawling, jumping, all of the kind of fundamental movement patterns that were important then are just as important now. <laughs> There's definitely a discord between conventional uh, workout methodology and what we should be doing according to uh, our genetic heritage. So exercise today is very much about performance. Sometimes it's seen as a way to lose weight very often isn't seen as a way to promote good health. Growing up, my father was completely stressed out, but he would go play tennis. And it was like a chore because it's like, ah, oh, crap, I'm late and I got to rush over there and I want to play tennis and we're going to make it totally competitive, which is nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't alleviate stress. It's not relaxing. And then rush home and do whatever. Most of the practices that we follow in terms of exercise tend to be very specialist. So I'm a runner, so I will continue to run and I will continue to run further distances, I'll increase my volume. If I'm great at playing a particular sport, I'll spend my time and invest my time in that particular sport. But as humans, we were designed to be movement generalists. We weren't designed to be focused on one particular activity. We would have to cover a wide range of, of movements. I really have never related well to exercise like in a gym setting. I never really have responded well to like pushing my body to the physical limits just to get physical results. But I enjoy going out into nature and moving my body and going on hikes and interacting with water and trees and wind and you know that to me I think is very kind of primal and instinctual and something that we're kind of detached from. Push Scott, push! Misconceptions about exercise is that it has to be punishing, has to be grueling, 
has to be something that you have to do as part of a, almost like treat it as, as a hobby or something that you do when you have some free time. Exercise should be, or activity more, most importantly, should be about integration with your day-to-day -day life. It's like we, as adults, we're like, we try and schedule in our play and you can't do that. You have to kind of wing it a little bit. It's not that we don't have time, because that's a crock. We just don't know how to do it. It's like, if I told most adults, all right, here's a field, there's a tree, there's this, there's that, go play. They just stand there like lumps. They wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't go climb the tree or roll around or anything. And it's kind of sad that we just forget how to do that. I think you need a certain balance of not moving too much and having enough rest. And we know we're chronically underslept and stressed. So if we get someone who, who's doing the sprint work and they're eating right, but then they're staying up till two in the morning watching TV, it's completely counterproductive. A lack of sleep is a great way for you to continue to have issues with, with managing weight. Part of that is because your cortisol production is, tends to be out of whack. Um, also, your, the hunger hormones, the ghrelin and the leptin can also be kind of confused based on a, a, a lack of sleep. And that can all stem from the amount of light exposure you get, the time for your melatonin production. So if you're using a lot of electronic devices at night, your body's not prepared for sleep. So you have less deep sleep and less REM sleep. And then the cycle kind of continues. So sleep is extremely important and the hormones that are kind of involved in managing sleep and managing and regulating appetite are all interlinked. So as well as getting your cell exposure of vitamin D, it also lets the body know when it should be alert and, and alive and well, and also when the body should be kind of slowing down and preparing itself for, for deep sleep. So anything that you do outside of that or kind of out of sync with that process uh, may mean you're, you're likely to increase weight, especially around the middle. By applying a paleo lifestyle, and again, we're talking what food works best for that individual, getting your sleep down, your stress, all those things. If you apply all of those aspects, I think a lot of people would feel a lot better, be on a lot less medications, have a lot less in healthcare costs and everything else, um, and a, just a better quality of life in general. Now I realize that it's not about what you inherited in terms of your genes, it's about what you decide to do in terms of gene expression, in terms of lifestyle, that affects how your genes respond to your environment. I'm going to tell you about my first client. To some of you who have met my first client, he worked in banking. This person was pre diabetic. What was interesting is after a very short term intervention, it's about six, to be fair, probably about nine months, six to nine months of intervention, which included diet, which included uh, other lifestyle changes, including activity. And um, we have the after picture. Blood pressure became optimal. Their blood glucose normalized. Hardly any VLDL, triglycerides had dropped to the floor. Their body fat was below 10%. Visceral fat was basically optimal again. And they weren't suffering from all those problems in terms of musculoskeletal problems. The diagnosis at that point was actually this is pretty good. Maybe this should be continued. So of course some of you know that that client was me. After conducting the, the paleo diet as, a, as almost as a one-person experiment, it was all looking far better than anything else that I, that I did. And the, probably the most interesting aspect of that is I didn't have to resort to any medication, which was the recommendation at the time by my doctor. Within three weeks, I felt amazing. 
I, I no longer had IBS. I no longer had chronic fatigue syndrome. I no longer had pain every time I ate. I no longer had what I thought was early onset rheumatoid arthritis, which everybody in my family had been diagnosed with, was gone. All of it was gone. So within about six weeks, I lost six years worth of yeah, fat, really, that I'd accumulated through my relatively unhealthy lifestyle at medical school. But the thing that was really noticeable um, was that I quite quickly, within maybe two weeks or so, had more energy than I'd experienced in really the whole of my adult life. I just felt fundamentally a lot better. I either had a gut or I could see stomach muscles. One of the two. I prefer to see stomach muscles. I'll take that over a gut. As a side bonus, within a week or so of starting the diet, my rash over my chest and under my arms disappeared and never came back. In combination with changing my diet, changing my exercise program, I was able to bring my body fat percent down 10% increase my muscle mass pretty dramatically. I used to have colds all the time. Colds that would often lead to severe uh, bronchitis. After a while I discovered just, I realized that they, they were gone. I very rarely get ill, but when I do get ill, I, I, I recover from it a lot quicker. My immune system is so strong that I recover much quicker and I heal much quicker. So I think uh, overall though, yeah, I'd say 100% health all the way. Uh, actually, I was in a debate the other the other day uh, in uh, in Ireland, and there was this nutritionist. She turned to me uh, when I was speaking, and she was like, "I would like to see your cholesterol values, or I would like to see your blood work." Yeah, uh, and uh, I I actually I answered her. I said, "Yeah, my my blood values are are perfect. They're much better than when I was a vegetarian for ten years." My doctor always tells me that I'm in excellent health and um, this is very different than, than before as being a vegetarian. So over the years what I've seen is many individuals try this dietary approach and have fundamental changes in not just their weight but their wellness, their energy, their well-being. If you look at their blood work that generally improves as well. When we started our practice and I started actually implementing it and saw dramatic changes in people's lives than that, and not just one, but everybody that we dealt with, then I realized that that was a very powerful tool, um, more powerful than anything I had ever done previously as a physician, just teaching people how to eat. Simple, yeah. So look, there is no such thing as a panacea, but in all my time, as a practicing doctor, I don't think I've seen anything that comes as close to it as this. When I started eating paleo, I had a pretty low budget and uh, I, I still could do that. You can find uh, alternatives to, to everything. You don't need to eat grass-fed beef every day. Essentially, meat, fish, fruits and vegetables, and then everyone can do that. Pork chops and some vegetables, or I make some kind of stew or braise or pulled pork that I can throw in the oven and forget about and roast chickens. You can be a, have a healthy diet if your major uh, protein and fat sources were fish and eggs, so it doesn't have to be meat. I eat so many different things that I never ate before. There's more than, than enough to replace the foods that I, don't, that I don't eat anymore. I think just about any chef would be completely thrilled to be given a basket of paleo ingredients because they're really high quality and you're cooking with really good meats and really good vegetables and local seasonal produce. Sometimes if I'm trying to recreate a dish from my childhood or an ethnic Thai dish that I want to be exactly how I remember it, it's about playing with flavors and balances and textures. That's hugely important to me, is making sure that people get to keep that experience of food. It's really strange to call it a diet because it's not actually a diet, it's just a way of eating. And I think the connotation with the diet is that it's in some way restrictive and uh, in some way bland and boring, you know, you cut out lots of those things. You know, now I love cooking with things like cauliflower and beetroot and celeriac, uh, artichokes, endives, things that I've probably never used to eat before, you know, it'd be broccoli and carrots and your typical kind of three veg and a meat. Whereas now I get to experiment with lots of new herbs and spices and 
and different techniques and sort of applying that to, to sort of whole foods. You know, you want to keep it varied, so you try out different cuisines, cooking with different seafood and different fish. That's exciting to me, and I think that's what I love about cooking paleo. I have discovered the paleo diet. I was overwhelmed by it. I per se wanted to make it the center of my life. And we rediscovered the joy of eating, of cooking, wanted to share that. So we tried out to, you know, to run a small restaurant. We never expected it to become so well known and so popular. A lot of people come with a certain prejudice. They heard about the paleo diet, they hear the word diet, which I actually don't like to use either. And they immediately think of health food, which is per definition not so tasty. And they think of restriction. They came for the theatrical side of it. They expected to be served by someone wearing fur and on stone plates. Then they come to our restaurant and they see Abundance. Abundance in colors, abundance in flavors. And they were surprised by the fact that it was quite a nice and normal environment with great food. They can feast on food. That is for many people an eye-opener. That makes them enthusiastic, of course. Plus they can eat fat, <laughs> and which carries flavor. I mean, it's an essential part of a meal. We try to not make it boring at all and very exciting. People get surprised when they visit my website because it's not even for people that eat paleo, it's just good food made with whole foods ingredients and good flavours, you know, lots of herbs and spices and things like that. I think what I'm trying to do with me running my food blog and, and publishing cookbooks is actually trying to show people that eating healthy or living healthy is not boring. You're not missing out on anything, you know. I think the perception is that the diet's a temporary, it's a band-aid solution to fix the problem. It's like taking a pill. And what I'm trying to show is it can be sustainable, it has longevity, it can be a, a, a sort of everlasting type of way of eating and living. And it's varied, it's practical, it's accessible, and it's very much doable by anyone. And so if I can change people's perception about healthy eating and healthy living, that it's not just for sort of the elite few, it can be applied to any kind of lifestyle, budget, country, location, gender, then hopefully I've done my job well. I've ordered some biltong for it, but we just need to add to the order. It's going to be here on Friday. Okay. There should have been extra in that last lot. Yeah, there was. I used it. Uh, what, for their, their packs? Uh, no, that's, in, that's included in what we needed to order. Right, okay. So that's all right. The growth over a very short space of time has been huge. Our trade sales have increased month on month, and our website sales have, again, increased month on month. We haven't actually had a month that we've gone backwards even continuing for Christmas and all that sort of stuff as well. We've been overwhelmed by the yeah. growth of it and, and the reception and the feedback that we've been getting as well. I guess that's what gets us up every morning is not only do we want to provide the best products that we can to people, but we part of what we do is trying to help educate people. Hey Leute, herzlich willkommen bei meinem Kanal Johannes Queller. Hier dreht sich alles um Buff Strong Barefoot. Ich habe die Ideen für ein Barfußleben und ich zeige euch, wie ihr die richtigen Techniken im Olympic Weightlifting, im Powerlifting, im Crossfit und im rein Bodybuilding richtig ausführt, korrekt ausführt, euch nicht verletzt. Ich habe die Tutorials für einen strong Lifestyle. Das heißt, wie the growth of the channel and of the box is telling me that we're doing the right thing at the right time. So people are having their eyes open for it and their minds open for it and they're, they're open for new things. What drives me is the fact that I'm so passionate about this movement. I mean, it has 
changed my life in so many ways. It's built self-confidence, it's eliminated health problems, and it just makes me feel awesome. And so I just feel this dire need to like translate that to our customers and get people excited and encouraged about doing something that's gonna help them. That's what drives me every day. I would not put my heart and my soul into this business and all of these resources and all of these finances if I didn't believe in what I was doing. There aren't that many places in the world where like-minded people can congregate and get together and share not just their ideas and experiences, but the sort of the emotion that goes along with how you feel living this way. So it's quite powerful, it's quite uh, empowering to be able to get here and uh, and share stories and hear other people's stories about the amazing transformations they've made in their lives. Yes, some people make choices that, you know, they maybe shouldn't have, but you know what? We still have answers and it's better for them if they're out of that mess, better for our country, it's better for everybody if they're fixed and they're healed instead of giving them drugs and telling them, sorry, you're just gonna have to live in a wheelchair and this is your life and your, the quality of your life doesn't matter. Bullshit, bullshit, I'm sorry. That's just not right. The reason why Keith and I do what we do here at Paleo FX is to reach as many people as possible. I will get on the highest roof and scream the loudest if I have to, but what I do is to try to save as many people as I possibly can. And I feel like the reason that I have to do that is because conventional wisdom has gotten us to this point, and the only way out is by helping people understand there's a better way. At that time, for me to find the paleo diet, I had to search and search and search. I wanted to get more awareness out there. It's like it was harder to find. And so I thought it would be really easy to find if it was just staring at somebody on a counter or on a, on a magazine rack at a checkout aisle. And so I thought, okay, well, let's, um, let's just do the magazine. And my wife, of course, thought I was an idiot because I have zero design experience or publishing experience or anything. I wanted to get in front of people where they needed it. So the guy or the gal pushing out their cart of processed crap from whatever grocery store, I wanted them to see a cover. Hopefully they look at it, they grab it. Those are the people I wanted to see. Not the crossfitting, uh, you know, person who's already following paleo kind of stuff. I want to provide information for them as well. But at the time, I wanted to reach people that maybe needed it more than those people that have already kind of found it. As human beings, we have far more in common with each other, regardless of where we're from, regardless of our racial heritage. We have far more in common from a, a DNA point of view than what separates us. And so believing that this diet is optimal for humans, I believe that anyone and everyone will benefit from the paleo diet. Paleo is for everyone, and it should be for everyone. I mean, there's such a healthcare crisis in this country with obesity and chronic conditions and sickness that if everyone just paid a little bit more attention to what they put in their mouth, I think we could 100% uh, combat that. If you want to lose weight, improve your, your performance as an athlete, or I think everyone can get benefits from it. Changing your sleeping habits, running outside or doing more movements, reducing your stress as much as possible, actually getting out in the sun regularly and, and uh, getting in touch with nature and being outdoors, not using technology as much as well. Um, and I think when people combine that with the food, they really feel the positive effects that it has on their well-being and their sort of longevity. Aging is about inflammation. And if you keep your diet clean, it's anti-inflammatory. And so it is an anti-aging diet. And it's designed for the duration of your life. You need to cut out the grains, and you need to cut out dairy, and you need to cut out vegetable oils. The first thing you do is you start at zero, right? You get rid of all the poisons, you bring in the good stuff, and you start from there. Cutting out grains and sugars, legumes, all that kind of stuff, and doing it for 30 days is good. Everybody should do that.
And that's just because those are the biggest offending things, or some of them are just horrible food-like items that nobody should eat anyway. But you gotta pull all that stuff out for 30 days just to reset. Because you can't listen to your own body and, oh, this makes me feel good, this makes me feel bad, unless you get that baseline kind of reset thing going. Get rid of all the poisons and the toxins in your environment. Just think of it as like spring cleaning, except that you haven't done your spring cleaning in 47 years, right? Know what to look for. Like if you go into a shop, it's really easy to go down one aisle and make a bad choice and then go down another aisle and make a, and make a better choice. Shift the emphasis more towards foods that are natural, unprocessed, primal, paleo, generally lower carb foods, okay? So we're looking at things like meat and fish and eggs and vegetables. People overcomplicate things. It's just natural food. It's just what you can go and buy from your butchers, from your greengrocers. Try buying food and eating food that still looks like what it, what it is originally, like as the source of the food. For some people, if they even think about cutting out a certain food, they shut down. So I think what I usually encourage people to do is just take baby steps and not make it so all or nothing. At least one thing that could be considered here is to take the two main meals of the day, say lunch and an evening meal, and convert them into something looking like paleo. Just try to replace the idea in your head that you cannot do that by I can do something much better. Just the fact that you're reducing your reliance on processed foods and manufactured foods you're going to be seeking food from better sources is going to improve your, your health. Make a commitment to learning how to cook the foods that you like and you start to experiment, you take the time and you uh, get on the internet and do some research, you can buy some recipe books or cookbooks and then you stay with it long enough so that you can have an intimate and intuitive relationship with your own body and to know whether things are good or bad for you. Take some blood panel work and do a snapshot before and after and then you can see what the results are for yourself. See how you look, feel, and perform. I mean, you have nothing to lose but to possibly get healthier, feel better, lose weight. You know, if you have any diseases, possibly reverse them. Whatever the reasons behind, whether, whether it's a science, whether it's, you know, a, a, another person's experience, if that works for you and you're seeing an improvement based on your blood work and based on, you know, reduction in body fat, and an, and an improvement in body composition, then it's something you're likely to want to want to continue. I cannot make you worse by giving you real food, whole food. I mean, you know, what's the downside to that? Even if you eat meat now, then you're more likely to, to choose better qualities and better cuts of meat and more healthy sources of meat. You recognize that what, what the animal that you eat, whatever they're eating, also contributes to their health. You will just I guess feel more in touch with where your food comes from. And I think you don't need rocket science for that. If you eat more good food, that's great. If you're still eating some of the things that you used to eat, it's way better than just eating all of that because you're so afraid to make any changes at all. Once you start to be consciously aware of what you're eating, and then you apply that to your internal environment then you realize you're gonna to have to make some changes. Or if you're not gonna be able to make those changes, willingly accept the consequences of your actions. If you start something, make sure you last long enough to feel a change, so don't skip on the first days or after 10 days, oh, it doesn't work. Like after two weeks, you cannot say if a diet works or not. And diet not in, in terms of really dieting, but like in terms of nourishing your body and eating. Starting off by implementing a diet, you're more likely to use that as a gateway to other areas of your lifestyle that will also, also improve. You're more likely to, to start thinking about activity levels and in, increasing those. You're more likely to start questioning the type of products that you have in your household, you know, the toxicity of those. You're more likely to consider, okay, you know, maybe I am drinking too much and I need to moderate that. There are other areas of your lifestyle that I believe will be looked at in more detail when you embark on this journey. It's gonna get better, not worse. So that's how I would look at it. It's a lifetime commitment. Just go out and have fun. It's a marvelous lifestyle, which brings so much more to your life, really. That's kind of the only thing I can tell somebody. I mean, do you want to feel better or not? I don't know. 